So um, this morning I'm going to do something a little different, have some fun with you all a little bit. And I, I took down the two baskets because I want to put into prominence, we'll come back to these two characters in just a little bit. There's Mr. Bill, and uh, there is, um, I'll explain him in a little bit, but we, we will call him Out of Box Man. And um, we'll come back to these two in just a bit. You'll, we'll have them up on the screen. Um, I want to think with you about this idea of imagination. We've started this series, and church-wide, we started this series to think about imagination as a way of thinking about, imagine the possibilities for our church, imagine what we can do next year. It's sort of a somewhat typical kind of stewardship theme, which is not bad, it's just sort of, it's sort of typical, and, and uh, there's a lot that we can do that we participate in. But I wanted to play with imagination in a different way as well. I wanted to play with imagination in terms of thinking about what seems impossible, because in life, there's a lot of stuff that we experience that seems impossible. There are a lot of places we find ourselves in that we're like, how did I get here again? How did this happen again? How is our country in this place again? How is our church in this? I mean, we think about these places that we get stuck in or that we can't get out of. And so we think, of, I want to think with you about imagination. And so I chose this theme, fitting square pegs into round holes, because mathematically, it's impossible to do this. And don't think I didn't research all week long because I told Linda, I know there's a way you can do this. But so far, the only way to do that is to change somebody's size. You got to change one size or the other if you're going to make them fit. They won't fit if they're both the same area around their shape. Um, where's Don Reynolds, by the way? Where, is Don in here? No. Did Don end up having to get out? I was, I was going to share with Don because he's a theoretical mathematician, and I was going to ask him, but he would just say that I already... There's no possible way. There is no possible way. So I want to think with you about how imagination can make what seems impossible possible. So let's think about that. And to do so, I want to kind of try something out that I, for the first time. We're going to see how much if this works for us or not. I'm going to try to cover these topics. All right? I'm going to try to cover these topics. I'll just go through really quickly the idea, which I've just described to you. Square pegs and round holes. Any questions? Two types of people. And Tim, my son Tim, the weeping prophet, toll booth syndrome, the evil of Sesame Street. Yes, folks? There's some evil there. The prophetic imag imagination, we'll look at Out of Box Man, A Baby and His Solution, and we'll look for some references from Peter Mayer and Einstein, and then J.W. and J.C., or J.W. and Jesus, and their three rules to close it up with faith is about reframing. So take a good look at that. We're going to hit all those topics in 15 minutes, and um, yeah, no way. He's like, no way you're going to do that. <laughs> I know you way too well, Tom. No way. Um, so we're going to cover that real quick, and to do that, we're going to start off with, I want to tell you a quick little story about my son, Tim. Uh, Linda and I were with Tim when he was young, five years old, they're about four years old, and classic sort of example of us trying to help Tim understand something, and he was not happy about some plans we had made about what we were going to do that afternoon. I don't remember what the plans were, I just remember the fit he threw. He was not going to have any part of it, it that wasn't for him, he didn't like it, he wasn't going to do it, he couldn't see any other way. And so Linda, ever the teacher that she is... She said, Tim, do you know the difference between a pessimist and an optimist? And she, he, said, he just looked at her and she said, Tim, an optimist is somebody who is seeing there's all sorts of possibilities. Like, you never know what you might find. You, you think one thing, but yeah, there's always a possibility you might really have some fun. An optimist is sort of hopeful and looking forward to something, even if they don't know what it is. They're always looking on the bright side. A pessimist is no matter what it is, they're always going to be unhappy, no matter what. Now, Tim, which would you rather be? An optimist or a pessimist? And without hesitation, he looked up de rather defiantly and said, I'd rather be an Episcopalian. <laughs> now, without having any clue as to where that word came up in his vocabulary, there was something about that that hit us both and would hit us time and time and time again. You were not going to pigeonhole that boy. No matter what you tried, he's going to think of some other way to think about it. And we're going to come back to that in a second. But first, I want to throw this quote up for you. There are two types of people. Those who think they are two, there are two types of people and those who don't. <laughs> right? We'll throw up the next image here. And this is the problem that we have. Two ways of seeing. Mindlessly or mindfully. There are two ways. We always find ourselves looking at either ors. 
And dualism is often really helpful in our lives because it does help us distinguish things from one another. But it also creates kind of a problem. A square peg, a round hole, any questions? Let's move on. <laughs> yes, I have a ton of questions about square pegs and round holes. Why do we presume that that's the end of the matter? But we find ourselves with this in everything that we deal with, right? Republicans, Democrats, any questions? Move on. Those in favor of LGBT inclusion, those against LGBT inclusion, any questions? Let's move on, right? And we find it in terms of ourselves in community issues and in our churches, in our denomination, in our own tribes, in our families. Any questions? Move on, right? But in our relationships then, it, then it becomes questionable. That, that's a little more complicated when we find it in our relation. We find ourselves up against this point where we're kind of stuck. And now it's my feeling and it's your feeling and I don't want to think about questions. I can't even begin to think about <laughs> questions that I can't also think about moving on. It's so hard to know what the next step is. So you might find yourself dealing with that as well. And there's nobody around to sort of give that, that, that new way of thinking in our lives. There's no one to try to challenge us. So we find ourselves stuck. I call these sacred cows. Churches have them, right? Uh, uh, po political parties have them. Communities have them. We have them in our relationships. We bring our sacred cows to our relationships, don't we? Without even realizing it, we bring our sacred cows to our relationships. So maybe you might be in one of these sort of things that I found myself in time to time. The incessant self-doubt story. The everyone's better than me story, which I really love Facebook for. Thank you very much. <laughs> the I've been living the wrong script. I'm an imposter story. The I'm getting the wrong end of the deal. I'm losing. I'm the victim here story. The every time I say hello Siri, she hates me story. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> if it's not our own stories at some point, then we know of people for whom these stories are true, for whom these kinds of realities are true. The patterns in our lives that they present, they seem intractable, they seem impossible to change, and they're ever reinforcing the shame and the doubt and the self-loathing and the sadness or the depression, and we're right back in the cycle again, right? We can't seem to get out of the patterns. And the story of our country seems to be stuck in the same kind of reality right now, as is our church. How do we see something else? Now, our, our, our text this morning, our text this morning is from Jeremiah, 1300s, wrote in 1300s B.C. So what, we're 3,000, 3,500 years old that, that this story took place. And, and this text is, to me, a perfect example of what's going on. Now, Jeremiah was often called the weeping prophet because he often wept for his people and for those in poverty and those who were hurting. And whenever the, whenever the Jewish people would get off track, which is what a prophet often does, is try to remind them that they're off track, that they're, they've broken the covenant with God, which was to be a blessing to the world. And now they're just thinking of themselves. And once again, the Jewish people were thinking of themselves and they'd even started swaying and they were worshiping other idols, and they were in captivity now. And so Jeremiah is weeping. But to me, there's a thing here in this, in this text that also is missed, right? We see things weeping. We see Jeremiah weeping and pleading to God. And we see that there's, a, there's an important cause because he's weeping for those in trouble, and the, the people have forgotten about their covenant with God, and he's weeping about that. But he's stuck. He's stuck. That's what I think we sometimes don't see in this text. He can't get out of this pattern either. He's like, I don't know what to do now. I'm stuck. I've cried out. I've said all I can say. you got to come and fix it. And that's where we often find ourselves in so much of our relationships with one another, in our, in our community, in our families. We get stuck. And so, no, I don't want to think about this. No, I don't have any more questions. I think I'll just move on. But you can't run from that, can you? You can dodge it for a while, but those things keep showing up. Those patterns keep showing up because they're never really addressed unless somebody will come along and fix it for us. And so we get stuck in something that I like to call, um, throw this up, I guess. Before, oh, next one, next one, yeah. Is this right? Am I right? Oh, yeah, here we go. Watch this. Oh. <laughs> 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 
Yeah, you'll leave it there for just a moment. I call this phantom toll booth syndrome, right? I mean, with the toll booth is an example from Blazing Saddles, and thanks to Philip for, for very artfully removing some curse words out of it there. Um, but those of you who've seen Blazing Saddles realize it's sort of this wonderful genre building and, and PC bending kind of, kind of a, a film. But, but this, this, this what strikes me as interesting. We find ourselves in these same places, up against the same wall, up against the same toll booth. We don't know what the magic thing is to get us through, but there's nothing on either side. But we can't see it because we're myopically stuck in this one place. We just can't see past it. Jeremiah can't see past it. He's stuck in his own cultural understanding of, a monothe of his monotheistic relationship with God. So it's his God against everybody else, and everybody else is winning. Come on, God, what's the problem here? So Jeremiah's stuck. We get stuck. How do we think past our position where we are? And I don't think it's our fault. I mean, I don't think it's, I don't think it's just our fault individually. I think it's Sesame Street's fault. <laughs> One of these things is not like the other. <laughs> One of these things just doesn't belong. Right? Can you figure out? I know which one doesn't belong. You're six months old. For the rest of your life, you're going to be going, I know which one doesn't belong. One of these things doesn't belong. I, you don't belong here. This doesn't belong here, right? We, we see things as black and white. We start seeing things as either or. We see things as dualistic. And again, dualism's helpful. I'm not trying to say that we can't. We need it. We need to be able to distinguish things at times. But the reality is, is that sometimes we forget reality, life, God, the kingdom is so much bigger, so much more possible than what we've thought is impossible, and so we miss it altogether. Let's bring up that other quote here. Sometimes we get so focused on what seems impossible that we can't see all the possibilities around us. And I get that. We're in, it's entrained. It's part of our biology, but we enforce it all the time with our behaviors and our attitudes, so we get stuck in this kind of phantom toll booth syndrome of describing, of distinguishing one thing for, out of, for, um, in, instead of, uh, as opposed to another. And this is where I want to think with you about imagination. There's two basic kinds of imaginations that we find ourselves in that we almost practice all the time. One is just sort of what I call repetitive, regurgitative imagination, which means we're, we're, we're capable of thinking about things. We're capable of seeing images in our mind. We're capable of remembering scenes and images and retelling stories. But it, even, even scientists will tell you, we don't retell our stories correctly. Oftentimes we add to them, we improvise them, we forget things. Uh, it, we, we're not particularly reliable narrators of our stories, that's true. But we tend to repeat what's already in the brain. So even when we come up with ideas, oftentimes we're combining things. I call that repetitive or regurgitative imagination. It's not a technical term. If you're a scientist, if you're a psychologist, Todd, don't judge me for my ignorance. <laughs> It's Tom's term, okay, so it's just my term. The, the second one I like to call is what I would call um, evolutionary imagination or um, spontaneous kind of imagination, and that arises out of a forced crisis. When we experience something we hadn't planned on, when we find ourselves in a situation that suddenly throws our reality out of kilter, and we're forced to try to figure out how to relate to it, how to deal with it. I think we find ourselves in this place of, of, of evolutionary imagination. Richard Rohr calls this sometimes second, second half spirituality, where we can actually, if we're, if we're willing to lean into it, if we're willing to lean into the, this crisis, then something else will come up. We'll discover something in the midst of this. We'll learn from this experience. We'll find a new way of seeing things. And that's often what I think is one of the healthiest ways of imagination, of us, to acquire, of us to participate with imagination, is this leaning into the things we experience and allowing ourselves to just be present in a way that helps us to see what else is there. But there's a third one that I, like to, that I, that I want to think about this morning, and that's where I find Jeremiah, and that's where we find ourselves often stuck. 
because of fear or because of pain or in the case of an author because we don't know what's on the blank page. Why do you think sometimes we get stuck at the toll booth even though there's nothing on either side? Because whatever's to either side, whatever's out there, it's better to be stuck in what's familiar even if it's painful, even if it's repetitive and goes nowhere. It's easier then looking at a blank page, any author in here, any painter in here knows blank pages are scary, right? Because we don't always have the confidence. We forget that we are literally in the being of the ground of being. We forget that we are literally creators and co-creators. And so we get frightened by the blank page, by the possibilities that we don't understand. What would happen if we left out there where it seems scary? What would happen? It's too scary. That's the prophetic imagination, I think. The prophetic imagination, according to Walter Brueggemann, is a change-oriented imagination that forces the questions. It forces us to look at something differently. It says, wait a minute, I think a square peg can fit in a hole. You're going, no, 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 it won't. But the prophetic imagination says, yes, 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 it can. Republicans and Democrats can love each other. LGBTQ people and anti-LGBTQ people can find a place where they love each other. People that we disagree with in our families, we can find a place, right? We can find a way through racism. Oh, I know it's hard. I know we're mindless about a lot of it, but I know we can do that. That's a prophetic imagination. Prophetic imagination says go ahead and leap out in faith. Go ahead and try to put something on that blank page. Go ahead and try to see something differently. Put up the next, if you can, there. Oh, yeah, here's my favorite. This is prophetic imagination. How hard was that? <laughs> right? Let's go over the next, the next thing here. You all know this quote, and I think this quote is amazing. I love this quote. There's a solution within every problem. That's true. There is a solution within every problem. However, you can't solve the problem with the same thinking that caused the problem. And that's the challenge. The sol it's trusting that we live in this ground of possibility, that we live in this ground of reality that, that has possibilities. We have to trust that we can hit it from a different angle, that we can try it from a different point of view. And it begins with questions. It begins with asking, well, no, wait a minute, do we have to assume that a square peg can't fit in a round hole? Or maybe we should even question whether square pegs or round holes should ever exist in the first place. Or maybe they should all exist and we just do away with spaces where they're supposed to fit. And then we'll find out, oh, they fit in new ways we never thought of, right? I mean, there's so many ways of rethinking about square pegs and round holes or about one of these things doesn't belong here. Which one? How many ways are a cat and meerkats alike? <laughs> Aside from the spelling, how many ways are they alike, right? How many ways are these different people alike? How many ways are those with whom I'm afraid of because they're different? They didn't fit with the, with the religious background that I grew up in, with the doctrine that I grew up in. And yet, how many ways are we alike? Right? Because we all rest and live in this ground of our being. So I want to go to the last couple of slides here. Let's throw this next one up here. Oh, well, this one. With a proper diet, moderate but consistent exercise, and the development of a healthy mindset, I should be able to fit in fine. Let's go to the next one. <laughs> All right. Did I? Oh, you know what? We didn't have, I didn't throw up this one. Um, reframing. I'll just bring this to a conclusion because I'm, I'm not sure what time we're at here. Yeah, but we're getting close. Um, oh, talking about reframing. I'm going to get a clock and put it up in the back. Won't that be fun? <laughs> When Linda and I were in New Mexico, we were in Santa, we were in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and Linda was going to buy me an anniversary gift or something. And so she went into an art gallery, and she said, I want something for my husband, and he's a little bit different. He thinks a little bit differently, and he's kind of quirky maybe. Uh, do you have anything for like that? And she said, well, so, tell me something else about him. And she says, okay, when he's buried and on his gravestone, it's going to say, he's not here. If there's a box here, he's nowhere around. <laughs> And so she found this little sculpture that was by a local artist, and they called it Out of Box Man, and she bought it for me. Meanwhile, my four-year-old granddaughter, when she was four, went out with her dad, 
and bought me a Mr. Doll, I mean Mr. Bill Doll, which I keep on the front of my dash <laughs> as I'm driving. Many of you remember Mr. Bill, right? Oh no, right? This is our problem, people, right? This is our problem. You know what? If you go to a bar and everybody you go to, there's a fight going on, it's probably you. If you're in relationships and relationships and it seems like they just follow the same patterns, it's probably partly you, right? We know this. If we find ourselves in these situations getting stuck, we know we have the freedom, and that's one of the wonderful things we love about our, our being in this world is we have all this freedom. But the downside of that is we forget that freedom also involves change. It also involves the possibilities of being something other, of needing to adapt, to evolve. And so instead, we think about change as what do they need to change or how do they need to change to fit. But that won't work. It's just repeating the same process. It's just substituting one Mr. Bill for another Mr. Bill, right? That out-of-box mentality, that reframing reference is what is required. When we talk in here, and it's awkward language if you came out of traditional or evangelical faith, when we talk in here about God as ground of being, we are reframing what it means to be related to the divine, to the holy. If we continue to practice sort of the original sort of monotheistic understanding that was 23, 24, 4,000 years old, all the way through 3rd century, 4th century, Augustine, Aquinas, and on all the way up, we find ourselves struggling. John Wesley struggled with this too. But he was a 1700s, he was an 18th century mentality. He didn't understand science that well, but he did know science was important. If he were around today, I wonder what he'd be thinking about some of those old early doctrines. But he did know something. He said, what is important are three rules. Do no harm, do good, and always walk humbly with God. Well, Jesus said the same thing years ago. Jesus said, love God, love your neighbor, love yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. You have to love yourself. If we reframe and understand God as the very ground of our being, we're no longer saying like Jeremiah, come on, God, do something. We're looking deep within and saying, come on, God, let's do something. Let's see what else we can create here in dealing with the problem at hand. It's a blank page always waiting to be rewritten. Amen.